I'm Kimberly C. Paul. As I travel throughout each state, I realize that death is just a moment. It is how we live until that moment that matters. Finding connection with friends, family, and complete strangers. Journey with me. This is the Live Well, Die Well Tour. Well, first of all, Allison Gilbert, it's good to see you. I know that you I, I know we're just using audio, but for some reason, it's really cool to see faces, especially in this time that we live in these days. And what's amazing is is that I've known you for a couple of years. We met when you were helping me with my podcast at Reimagine. Yes, and I yes, think you're also pleasure. the bridge. Yeah, I think you're the bridge also between me and Hope Edelman. Uh, yes, I'm sure. I adore Hope. I adore you. And when I see two smart, able, fantastic thinkers and two amazing, smart, you know, wonderful women, I love making these kinds of connections. Oh, you're, well, I I adore both of you as well. What's amazing is I did not know you were an Emmy award winning TV producer. You walk around like you're just Alison Gilbert and, you know, me. And oh my gosh, you are so <laughs> funny. Guilty as charged. I did have a pre kind of grief life, if you will. And I spent 20 plus, plus years, 20 plus years uh, in TV news. I was a producer at. CNN and MSNBC when it first launched. And before that, I made the rounds in various New York uh, City TV stations. And so that's where I got my journalism uh, chops really, really fine tuned. And I've used all of those skills for the work that um, brought you and me together, which is grief and loss and resilience and exploring these topics that have become ever more meaningful to me over the years. Well, and you also have been known to write for a small newspaper called the New York Times. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. I just had an article up here just a few days ago in the Sunday section. Um, so I feel really blessed. And I tend to focus on issues that relate to families and really talk about the what makes us all tick and when we're knocked down, what can really lift us up? And the latest article that I wrote for the Times was really about if you do have um, a living grandparent, uh, which I think for many children, or if you're a young adult or an adult and you have your parents still, even one left, making sure there's connection between that living grandparent and your child during COVID, if there's distance involved, is actually really hard hard. You know, how do you make sure these connections can um, endure and thrive during COVID when people are not seeing each other in person? And so that was a real gift um, of a story to be able to write for the New York Times. So I feel really grateful. Yeah. And do you know, I've been thinking a lot these days that uh, we're using Zoom, which is a great platform and other platforms that you can see people and chat with people, but there's still something missing inside my heart. Like I'm desperate for human connection. Oh, well, I want to reach through the Zoom and hug you, of course. <laughs> and I, so I want to <laughs> hug you and I want to kiss you on the cheek. And I'm desperate for that connection. Are you kidding? Of course. And, um, and I think that's really important when we're talking about grief and loss. It's like we get so much from others who have been through similar experiences. And yes, there is so much value from others online support groups and chats. And, you know, there's apps, of course, now that connect people who are suffering um, with a recent death. And so all of those are valuable. They're valid. They're important. They're of this moment, perhaps more than ever before. But I think everyone would agree yeah. in person is better. And it doesn't mean that the other opportunities that are online are um, bad. Uh, there's just something missing. And there's a great opportunity when it comes with in-person connection. And yeah, I think we're all grieving 
for that as well, to be honest. I do too. But what what I'm happy about is that I, I finally came to the realization that no matter and I love these platforms because that's my connection to the out the world out there for right now. But it's that I don't think any platform is going to affect the in person kind of it, it won't go away because all of us in many kind of especially with grief and support groups, it is that in person energy feeling that you can see and touch someone and feel that energy. So that's what I'm grateful for, even though we are taking. Um, full benefit of all these platforms. I know that one-on-one or group, it won't ever be replaced. So, you know, we find ourselves in a weird time through COVID, just like you were mentioning your New York, uh, you know, your New York Times article. And you, the thing is, we we are looking for ways to still continue to grow. And what I love is that I've seen you on, <laughs> I've seen you all over. Um, the social media networks, really promoting online support. And we were discussing this prior to coming on, but it's on demand. So people can can go as slow or as fast. You don't have to save a, a day in your calendar. You just have to figure out how your online courses will fit into your life. But tell us about what are you offering? Why are you offering? And how do we access what you're offering? Well, because of COVID, um, so much of what I used to do, which is speaking across the country to different organizations, hospice organizations, hospitals, funeral homes, I mean, you name it, any organization that needs extra guidance about grief, loss, death, how to remember our loved ones, how to kind of embrace anxiety, figure out ways to manage anxiety and move forward. These are all things that I really care very deeply about. And those were the topics that I could no longer talk about, deliver in person. So what I've done during COVID is that I've developed four new e-courses that, as you said, you don't have to show up at a particular time or day. They're all available on demand. You can get access to them individually, or obviously there's lots of savings for buying you know, bundles. Sure. But really, these are the four topics. So the first one, I think, is among the most timely, which is how to plan and organize the most meaningful virtual memorial that you can. So if during the coronavirus pandemic, if you have lost a loved one, whether or not it's because of COVID, your family's memorial, that funeral, that celebration of life, no matter what is different now, right? Because we can't show up in person to these events the way we had prior to COVID-19. And so the first course is about how to plan and organize the best, the most meaningful, and really the most intimate virtual memorial that you can. And so I go through tips, tricks, strategies to make these events that may seem impossible to truly honor your loved one's life to the magnitude that they deserve we go through step by step by step how to do this so you feel like you're really celebrating that life. So that's the first one. That's amazing. It's so relevant. Yeah. And but well, also I wanted to be timely yeah. and to be honest when I get emails from readers of my books what's happening now is that everything has been upended when it comes to even the most immediate death. And there's guilt and there's fear about, well, I can't memorialize my loved one um, the way I would have before COVID. And I say, yes, of course, you're absolutely right. But let me tell you, let me hold your hand figuratively and let me show you how you can do it so you feel you truly feel that you are honoring their memory to your best capacity. And that's what that, you know, on-demand course is all about. Do you think we'll, we'll one day win 
I should say, um, when we can get back together, do you think this, your course can even open it up? Because there's always some family members that can't make the, the fu- actual funeral or the actual f- big event, the celebration of life. I hope moving forward, when we do get back to being in person, that this still can be utilized for those who maybe can't travel or can't, doesn't have the money, but the health is bad. What do you, do you think that's plausible as well? I do. And I think what's actually happening now is that instead of families who are going through this virtual memorial process feeling that they're giving their loved one short shrift, what I am encouraging them to think about is to reframe their point of view. And my point of view is that now you get two opportunities. You get the now, the virtual opportunity, which is immediate and satisfies that really that kind of internal goal to do that kind of right now commemoration of your loved one's life. But then when this pandemic is over, you will get another shot of doing another event that is in person. And so in that way, you're actually getting to memorialize, honor, and celebrate your loved one twice. Wow. And I think that is a remarkable opportunity. And so that's why I developed that course. And then the other course that I, um, and, and, and there's four. So another one that I developed is about grief and anxiety. Um, I think right now, um, maybe not more than ever, right? Because I think <laughs> yeah. people have suffered from grief and anxiety for a very long time, no matter when your loss has occurred. But there's a new dynamic because of COVID, right? There's a new dynamic that makes this conversation feel more timely. The course is about grief and anxiety. So it's not about because of COVID, but I think because of COVID, it feels more urgent. And so if you want tips and strategies for bringing down the temperature, if you want strategies for helping you kind of take advantage of free resources that can be really helpful to make you feel more grounded and more joyful and more in control right now when so much feels, you know, out of our control. That's what that on-demand course is all about. And so I'm really, really excited about that one too. Man, I might have to sign up for that one. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, it can get tough. And you have, you have two more. Yeah. And so the last two on-demand courses, they're similar uh, in topic. So let me just talk about them sure. together. One is about objects and heirlooms, those possessions that you may have inherited from loved ones over time. So think about your childhood home, think about furniture, think about you know, odd stamp collections or marbles, you know, or thimbles or thread, whatever your loved one left behind. Maybe it's, you know, shirts and clothes and suits and dresses, whatever it is that your loved one left behind, we are talking about in this e-course, what to do with them, what to keep, what to donate, how to actually completely transform an object. So maybe you didn't like that particular, I don't know, sweater, what can you do with that sweater to save its sentimental value, but really upend to upcycle what you do with that sweater that can actually keep their memory alive and bring you happiness. So that's about objects and heirlooms. And you and have, there's one, yeah. Go, well, you, you've you been on the Today Show. I mean, I've <laughs> seen talks. You don't know how, when I was, was doing some prep for this podcast, that you, you, I can't tell you how much watching and hearing about changing things really touched me because my oh. grandmother gave me, or my mom gave me my grandmother's first engagement ring, but I don't wear white gold. It was, it was silver gold. And then the, the band was, um, the yellow gold. Well, cause and, you only want to wear platinum. We know you. <laughs> right. But <laughs> of course <laughs> I'm totally about that, but yeah, I, I wanted to wear it 
So I went to the jeweler and changed the the gold white gold, I mean the the yellow gold into white gold because I I wear white and it I wear it all the time. And 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 it goes also with another grandmother, you know, this cookie jar she's always had. Now my dog has the dog because I want to incorporate it within my life, not setting on a shelf, you know, just not doing what they're supposed to do. Listen, you are preaching to the choir. And what I mean by that is, is that these objects have the capacity to keep the memory of our loved ones alive because they crack open moments where we can talk about our loved one, when we can say their name out loud. And so every opportunity in that e-course that I've just developed about objects and heirlooms is all about how we can get more pleasure and more satisfaction and more joy from these objects. And the final course is related. It's about photographs and Mm. VHS tapes and old home movies and 35 millimeter slides, all these wonderful tethers to our past that unfortunately, maybe collecting dust, you don't know how to digitize them. And once you digitize them, what do you do with them that could amplify their power to connect you, not just to your loved ones who have died, but to your family and friends in the present who also want to remember with you. And so both of those courses, objects and heirlooms, and then of course, photos and more, they're both about the stuff, right? It's the stuff. But how do you use that stuff to amplify the relationships you have with your family and friends today, but also the loved ones who have passed away? And so I'm so glad you gave me an opportunity to talk about these. Yeah, it's so key. Because during COVID, this is really what I've been working on. Well, I mean, I didn't know I needed permission that it was okay to change the ring or do I did because my mother still doesn't know that I changed it because I'm afraid that that might hurt her. But I wanted to, I needed permission. And I felt like watching and listening to you that, man, that was really okay to change well, that item. Change it. Me. 100% because ultimately, isn't that allowing you to kind of talk about the meaning of that object Otherwise, perhaps it would stay in a jewelry drawer. It would stay in a jewelry box. It would be in a closet. It would be in a basement or an attic. And then you wouldn't have the ability to use it as a launching pad for keeping memories alive. And that's what my books are talking about too. When I think about past and present, keeping memories of loved ones alive, you know, that's what I'm talking about. It's 85 ideas for keeping the memory of those we miss most in our present. But sometimes we don't know how to do it or like what you just said, we don't give ourselves permission. And so I think there are 85 ideas in that book, past and present, that they're meant actually, I haven't ever thought about it this way, they're meant to give you permission to move forward in ways that are hopefully uplifting Mm -hmm. that are hopefully empowering and just really make you feel happier and stronger. I love it. I I love those courses. And again, you're, you're right. It's, it's giving ourselves permission to change it, to fit who we are. And you are, I cannot tell you how right you would be. The ring would be in a jewelry box because I don't wear white, yellow, gold, and it would not be what it is to me today. Totally. Should we give should we give your listeners a little discount coupon code? Come for the on, courses? babe. I'd love it. They would love it. <laughs> especially during COVID. Yeah, well, listen, I just launched these courses. And so if you put in the code early bird, all caps, all one word, early bird, it'll get you an extra $30 off the already reduced launch pricing. Wow. So that's just extra. That's just extra for your listeners. Oh man, so, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so excited about them. So I hope that helps, you know, some of your listeners, you know, check out these four different on-demand courses. Well, in in during COVID, we can't be places. And I've seen, like you said, you've spoken everywhere. And what is it like for you to feel like you're still contributing during this time that 
you know, you can't be in face to face with people because that's what you do. I'm sure that helps you in some of your creativity and your outlet as well. You know, I, there's nothing I enjoy more than talking to you or talking to readers or talking to anyone who has decided to take one of these new e-courses and then they have a question and then they get in touch with me. Listen, this is a weird time. And any moment that I get to actually have substantive connection with another human being and to know that in maybe some small way, I don't want to overstate it, but in some small way that I'm able, and again, to use your word, make a contribution, I feel humbled Mm -hmm. and I feel gratified and I feel thankful that we do have um, email, (laughs) that we have Zoom, that we have the ability to send text. I mean, I truly can't imagine how much more isolating it would have been had we not had all of these tools during COVID-19. And so I try to look at the blessings and a lot of these blessings come in the form of technology. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we were in the beginning, we were talking about you being a television producer and a journalist, you know, there is a bridge from what you used to do to what you now do. Help, help my listeners understand how did you go from, well, you're still the journalist, but how did you incorporate or why did you incorporate the grief aspect? Well, it's a two-pronged answer. So the skill set that I bring to this work and to the articles that I write, the essays that I write, the books that I write, and now these e-courses, they all use the same skill set that I really very strategically honed for 20 plus years working in the news. So how to ask questions the best ways to research and get factual, trusted information that can be used to make us feel more in control. The ability to not be fearful of deadlines. Um, I really work better when the pressure is high. (laughs) And so um, I'm able to turn things around in a way that feels Um, with competency, but also with speed. And I feel like now during COVID, when so much is changing so rapidly, um, I do feel well-equipped to use those skills um, that I did practice um, very intentionally for 20 years to bring those skills to bear in this field of grief and loss and bereavement. And so That's the skill part. The personal part um, is that I also, like many of your listeners, have suffered my own losses. Um, Both of my parents died relatively young. Um, I was a young adult. I wasn't yet married when my mother died. I didn't have my kids. Um, My father passed away when my oldest child was just... um, a toddler and my daughter wasn't even born yet. So she, my daughter, who I, you know, of course adore, never met either one of her maternal grandparents. And so this life experience coupled with my professional experience has really become my passion. It's become my um, roadmap of what I want to do. I want to help others who are also going through similar experiences. It's never the same, but I feel with my skill set being a reporter that I can then impart factual, helpful information that I know I can stand behind. Um, I do think there, as we all know, there's a lot of misinformation Mm -hmm out there that ultimately could be harmful. And I wanted to be able to um, let people who are at their most vulnerable, right? When you're grieving, you are vulnerable. And I wanted to be, if I could, um, 
uh, somewhat of a bomb, you know, somewhat of a salve, somewhat of a band aid during that time. And I feel really lucky that if there's anyone out there who feels that I have been that for them, even mm-hmm. if it's just one person, then I feel that my personal losses will have had some measure of purpose. So I appreciate the question very yeah, much. Yeah, I you know that is such that is such a great answer how you combine skill and your own personal experience to create a platform of storytelling and healing and and moving through that. And I believe you did that so many years ago during this whole thing that still is on in the back of our minds called 9-11, when you reported um, during that day. But also what was amazing to see is that you covered this event as a journalist, but everyone else was feeling, the entire world was feeling this overwhelming loss. But yet you could stick and still tell the story to help us kind of put our arms not even around it, but sort of understand what was going on. My question to you is, what the hell was that like? Because I'm sure you had your own grief as you were covering the story, not only as a a journalist, but as a New Yorker, born and raised in New York City. And and so what what were you thinking? And uh, first of all, I need to thank you. Um, My family was in New York during during 9-11, and it was because of people like you that I was actually informed what was going on with my family, even though I couldn't talk to them, the phones were dead. So talk to me a little bit about that experience and how that also connects you to grief. Well, I was um, a producer for the local New York NBC station, and I was assigned to go downtown to right where the events were unfolding and to find the reporter who I was assigned uh, to work with that day, who we actually never even found each other. But that's, of course, because of what unfolded um, and to help cover the event. Fast forward, the second tower collapsed blocks from where I was standing. I ran for my life, uh, thinking that the building would fall like a tree uh, and completely um, I, to kill me. Um, and what ended up happening, as we all know, is that it didn't fall like a tree, it imploded. But that dust storm did um, push me over. Long story short, I was taken to Bellevue Hospital. And if you know Bellevue, it obviously has one of the most preeminent triage emergency rooms in the city. Um, Tubes were put down my throat. My clothes were cut off in the emergency room to check for any signs uh, that I was impaled by debris. Um, This was a traumatic experience for me. Um, for a while, I definitely suffered, um, for sure with, uh, PTSD, I have no doubt. Um, and it was the advice, um, from a really good friend that in order to move forward, I had to purge quite literally, um, from my being those feelings that were making me, um, sick, ill, not able to move forward as quickly as I had wanted to. So when you're ill and you have a stomach ache, you know, people tell you, oh, go throw up. Or when, once you throw up, you're actually going to feel better because whatever that is in your system will then be out of your system. And I hate to be so graphic, but that's what writing did for me. It allowed me to purge Everything that I was processing because of 9-11, because of the PTSD that I suffered. So writing to me was like, and I'm sorry to say it, but it's true. It was like vomiting. Mm -hmm. It allowed me to get it out of my system. And that became the transition point for me between being in a newsroom, reporting events for CNN or MSNBC, and like having that be my 20-year career. That experience of 9-11, the importance that writing took on for me became my pivot point. And that's when I became um, a writer. Slowly but surely, um, I my first book is no mistake. It was about how broadcast journalists 
covered 9-11. So there's no doubt in my mind that, of course, of course, that would have been my first book. And then as life goes on, my parents passed away. And then I really slow, I really continued that um, re machination, if you will, of my career. And now um, I've written four books onto my fifth. And it's really been, um, I believe, and I hate to oversay it because maybe it sounds so trite, but from the worst hmm. was born a career that I now find so meaningful. And to me, that is a hard earned lesson of grief and loss that even when you can't see it, when it happens, there will be at some point a time when you look back and say, huh, if that didn't happen, this good thing in my life would have been impossible. Hmm. And that's not to say that I'm glad right. <laughs> 9-11 happened. That's not to say I don't miss my mom and dad every single day, but I can't change those facts. The only thing I can do is embrace one word, and that one word is the word and, A-N-D. Both happened, both are true. The experience of 9-11 and my new career as a writer and journalist who is wholly trained on these types of topics. Both are true. It's the word and that I think can bring so many people peace. These oh, discussions wow, you're giving don't me chills. have to be binary, right? No, these discussions you're right. don't have to be binary. I love that. And oh my gosh, what what a life you've lived. And, uh, and I thank you so much for who you are, not only for me, um, but for who you are, even you're in the, you're the only journalist in the nine 11 museum that's been highlighted and, and um, talked about. And it's really, it really is when you look back how you got to where you are, but you're right. You, you would not wish that on it. You very well, you just said it just so eloquently and it's, it's become who you are. And that to me is uh, someone that's changing lives. You've changed mine um, ah, just by who much you're making my day. No, but seriously, how many people can take from the rubble literally and rise like the Phoenix and find something good in it. And to me, that's a very powerful lesson by someone who has not only spoke about it, but has freaking lived through it. Literally. Thank, Literally. Well, I, I can't add to that. I am, my jaw is on the table and um, I appreciate what you've just said. Um, it, it just, uh, it's humbling. And um, I think what you bring to the table is so important. And I love your podcast. Oh, and thank you. It brings such light. And it has been such an honor and pleasure. Yeah, it's um, been to wonderful. Be asked to be with you today. And well, so, I, thank I just, you. Well, you're, you're like one of my mentors, you know, with the journalism background, you really are. And I, I really see you as a teacher to me and to thank you for who you are. But I know that, that hundreds and thousands of people feel and will feel the same way. Before I let you go, I must revisit where we can find these e-courses because it is, I, I'm going to take advantage of some of them because I must. Um, so where can we find them? Yeah. So if you, thank you. If you go to my website, which is alisongilbert.com, just go to alisongilbert.com slash courses. That's the easiest way to do it. You'll see all four. So the first one is about how to plan and organize a meaningful virtual memorial. The second one is about how to manage grief and anxiety. And the third and fourth one are about objects and heirlooms and photographs and scrapbooks and 35 millimeter slides and all of your family treasures. 
And um, we were just talking about before. And if you want any of these courses, um, I'll give everyone th- an extra $30 it's off. If you use the, yay! Thank you. If you use the code early bird, all one word, all caps, um, there's already reduced pricing on my website. This is $30 more off than what everyone else um, has access to on my website. So just put in the code early bird. And I just hope that you love these on-demand courses as much as I have well, um, created I think, them. I thank you for discounting the price and then help having my listeners even discount it a little bit further. But these are not expensive courses, people. I, I've been to our website. I've been checking them out. And please take advantage of things. Um, we've got to still keep growing as people. And some of her ideas in how we can reinvent things that our loved ones used to wear and how to incorporate them in our in, our, in our lives has just meant the world to me um, because Aww. I've applied some of those and and I really do appreciate it. Allison, thank you for who you are, not only to me, but for your your people and the many other people that you're touching on a daily basis. You're special, kid. You really are. Oh my gosh. I have enjoyed this so and I'm so grateful to you and knowing you and calling you my friend. Yeah, so I, I appreciate that. Thanks for joining us today. And remember, you're the designer. This podcast is produced by Jason Andre with Seven Season Films. If you're interested in telling your story via podcast, look him up. You can find him at sevenseasonfilms.com.